Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our webinar organized by Onward, where we're going to um, have our focus on getting to net zero. So the purpose of this event really is to highlight the opportunities and challenges of implementing our commitment to have a net zero economy. I'm Caroline Spellman. I'm co-chairing this program of work with my namesake, Caroline Flint. And we will be part of a panel which look forward to taking your questions and thoughts. It's, but it's my pleasure this morning to make the introductions to your panelists. And so, as I mentioned, Caroline Flint, a well-known figure in British politics and a lot of experience around Whitehall, having served under two prime ministers as ministers in five different government departments. But I think really importantly for this brief, I'd like to remind you of her role as Shadow Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change. And I know that Caroline is absolutely passionate about this subject, and she advocates the UK adopting what she calls muscular economic nationalism. And no doubt in her remarks, she's going to explain to you how she sees that and what that means. We're also joined by an important practitioner in this area, so Guy Newey, from the Energy Systems Catapult. He's their strategy and performance director. Um, he joined them in 2018 after being energy and climate advisor to Greg Clark. So once again, we have a panelist who's a lot of experience in working in this area. And before that, he was a special advisor to Amber Rudd uh, and uh, as a head of policy. Um, important, I think, to remember that he was also, before going into politics, Head of Policy at Over Energy. So that's going to be a very important aspect of our work as a panel, which is actually to look at the implications for the high emitting industries and what we can do to make sure that they are part of the opportunity that a net zero carbon economy presents. And then we're very fortunate this morning to be joined by Kwasi Kwarteng, the most recently appointed Secretary of State uh, to the cabinet, but very important in his role as Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. He, he is actually, uh, which Caroline and I will know is quite a luxury in politics, got the opportunity to implement some of the policies he himself was part of generating as Minister of State for Business, Energy and Clean Growth. But I must really thank Kwasi for joining us this morning, because to be take up this um, this opportunity this morning, 13 days into a new job, is quite hard, but it has released up Alok Sharma to do what he really needed to do, which is the heavy lifting behind the scenes to make sure we get a good outcome from the Conference of the Parties in Glasgow in November on climate change. And I know that Alok is already uh, working really hard, trying to get uh, different countries to align so that we do get a good outcome, not just for the UK, but for the planet. So those are our panelists this morning. We're looking forward to what they're going to each going to have to say. They're going to have about 10 minutes each to make some uh, personal remarks. And then we've got plenty of time for questions. And we've already had a number of those submitted, which are really good, interesting questions. So if you haven't submitted yours yet, there's an opportunity to do that on this webinar. But I'm going to hand over straight away to Kwasi so that he has the opportunity in his 10 minutes to give us his view about the opportunities and challenges of getting to a net zero economy. Kwasi, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Caroline. And of course, as you say, uh, this is, I'm fairly new into the job. But more importantly, and the reason why I got this job, I think, uh, is uh, I was Minister of State for Energy uh, and uh, uh, Clean Growth. And in that role, which I uh, devoted myself to for 18 months, uh, we really managed, uh, uh, with a great team I have in Bayes, uh, great officials, uh, really to put some flesh on the bones in terms of the net zero strategy. So we cast our minds back to June 2019 when the net zero legislation was passed. Um, I was appointed on July the 24th, uh, 2019. And coming into the department, uh, we were very conscious of this net zero legislation. We were very proud of it. But there was still um, some degree of granularity, some, uh, a lot of policy, frankly, 
that needed to be developed. And when I look my uh, cast my mind back to that time, uh, I'm very struck by the fact that um, over the course of 18 months, we managed to feed in and help shape uh, the Prime Minister's 10-point plan uh, for net zero and for the green economy, the green industrial revolution. And also, uh, which was uh, an ally of that, uh, was the Energy White Paper. And the Energy White Paper that was produced, that was published uh, last month in December 2020, uh, is the first Energy White Paper uh, that the government has uh, produced since 2007. Uh, and I've read the 2007 document, and you wouldn't believe, if any of you want to see how far we've traveled uh, as, a, as a country, uh, you should compare these two documents. I mean, the issues in 2007 were things like uh, security of gas supply, um, international terrorism, uh, threats to uh, security. There's not a word about net zero. There's very, very little about climate change. And in that 13 years, uh, we've really managed to, uh, to, to, to shift the dial on this. Now, the big challenge in terms of uh, net zero, and this is the challenge that I have to deliver on, is we've got to, we've got to actually realize and, and, and deliver on all the great policy work uh, that, we've, uh, that we've embarked on and that we've largely completed. So as I said, from July 2019 to December 2020, we were very focused on the Prime Minister's 10-point plan, which I'll run through very cursorily, and the Energy White Paper. The 10-point plan uh, was uh, offshore wind, uh, 40 gigawatts uh, by 2040 capacity, um, hydrogen, the five gigawatt uh, target by 2030 in terms of uh, hydrogen production, a commitment uh, to nuclear and also large-scale and uh, small modular reactors, uh, electric vehicles, which, of course, my department uh, uh, is responsible for, but also uh, alongside our DFT colleagues in the Department for Transport. Um, public transport, uh, cycling and walking, which, again, I think uh, our colleagues in the DFT lead on. And then there were other, the other DFT uh, uh, interest in the 10-point plan was, of course, in Jet Zero, you know, decarbonizing uh, maritime and aviation uh, for forms of transport. Uh, the, 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 then, of course, we have the uh, buildings, heat and buildings, which again is, I think, uh, owned, if I can use that word, exclusively by Bayes. And we've got a heat and building strategy, which I was very pleased to initiate, and I hope will be published uh, very quickly. Um, and then, of course, we've got carbon capture. We've got uh, nature, uh, which is owned by DEFRA in terms of planting uh, trees and capturing carbon in that way. And of course, finance, which again is a treasury lead. Now, of all those uh, 10 points, th there are clearly four, three or four that jump out as Bayes' responsibilities that have huge implications for net zero. So the offshore wind uh, uh, capacity increase is extremely important. And of course, we've got supply chain ambitions where we want to have 60% of the supply chain uh, UK content, UK produced. Uh, so that fits uh, squarely into the jobs agenda and also the levelling up agenda. And I'll talk about that a bit later. Um, the, 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 the challenge of uh, being able to produce hydrogen um, is, is, is acute. Uh, we have to respond to that. And in fact, and people say, well, in Europe, they're spending all this money on hydrogen. And in Germany, uh, they're spending all this money on hydrogen. I'll say two things about that. One, the success of our uh, industrial capacity uh, rollout in, in net zero has largely been driven by private finance. The job of the government isn't to spend its way to net zero. The job of the government is to come up with the right incentives uh, from which uh, uh, private uh, sector uh, can be inspired, the private sector can be inspired and actually deploy capital. So if I look at offshore wind, we spent something like 94 billion as, in total on the deployment of offshore wind. But the vast majority of that money hasn't been taxpayer money, it's been uh, private uh, investment. And all the offshore wind installations which have been successful, we've got something like 35% of the global capacity here in the UK all of that is being driven uh, by private uh, finance. And, and our job is to try and do the same thing. That's a, a considerable challenge, uh, to do the same thing for hydrogen production and also uh, for carbon capture. Because, uh, And the other distinguishing feature, I think, of our approach to hydrogen compared to uh, the uh, countries in the EU or Germany is that we're, we're operating in both. I mean, to use a metaphor from tennis, I say we're playing in both tournaments. Okay, there's a green hydrogen piece, which is renewable hydrogen, which is... Uh, produced by electrolyzers 
and we've got some good, great companies uh, in that space. But also there's a blue hydrogen piece, which is not produced uh, by electrolysis, but is rather produced by uh, what's called methane reformation. So essentially you break down uh, the methane and produce CO2, which you then capture, the carbon dioxide you capture, and then the other product is hydrogen. Uh, and that's uh, so-called blue hydrogen. And our strategy uh, as, a, as a country is to do both um, and, and encourage uh, the production of both. And there are very few uh, countries uh, that are doing that. So, um, you know, getting the right incentives for that in terms of uh, deployment of capital is, 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 the, is the trick. Um, lastly, uh, I would just say that many of you will know about the government's levelling up agenda. And that's the idea, that stems from the idea that uh, too much of our investment, too much of our focus has traditionally been in on uh, London and the Southeast. Uh, and that's a self-fulfilling prophecy because the more you invest in London and the Southeast, the more productive it becomes uh, and the more likely you are to get a higher return. And this uh, vicious cycle or virtuous cycle, depending on which way you look at it, has been perpetuated for decades. And it was very clear to me, and I was PPS to the Chancellor, uh, Philip Hammond, uh, for a couple of years. Um, it was very clear to me that the Treasury model um, was, uh, was always looking at return on, on, on investment, and it really privileged uh, the uh, London and the Southeast, the, the most productive area of our economy. What we've tried to do as a government is to emphasize, re-emphasize uh, the leveling up agenda uh, and the desire to invest in areas which um, have traditionally not had as much government investment as we would, we would like. And of course, the leveling up agenda fits very squarely into the net zero agenda because all the projects I've described, the hydrogen production, uh, the carbon capture uh, installations, the offshore wind uh, and the manufacturing that, that underpins uh, delivery on offshore wind capacity, all of that is situated hundreds of miles from London and the Southeast. And as energy minister, one of the great things, and unfortunately COVID has uh, impaired this, but one of the great things I did is I enjoyed doing as energy minister was traveling all around the country, you know, going to Hull to see the uh, you know, Siemens Gamesa uh, wind turbine factory, uh, going up to uh, uh, Teesside to speak with Ben Houchen and discuss possibilities of uh, carbon capture sites there, uh, going to Grimsby and talking to ITM Power, who manufacture electrolyzers. All of these opportunities are in our traditional uh, heartland areas uh, and uh, which uh, have been neglected in the past, but which I think through the Green Industrial Revolution can, can really um, drive growth and, and represent a uh, massive economic opportunity for people who live uh, in, those, in those areas. So the Green Agenda and the Leveling Up Agenda really um, meld together very effectively. Uh, and our job now is just to try and deliver um, you know, these, great, uh, these great projects and this great uh, prospect. Thank you very much, Kwasi. Um, that's almost exactly 10 minutes. Well done. And actually, the point you came to conclusion on is a wonderful segue into giving the floor to Caroline Flint. You just need to unmute yourself, Caroline. Um, because precisely you are speaking to four, two former secretaries of state who represented the Midlands and the North. So we're really pleased to hear you make that point. And of course, those are the initial findings of the research programme that Onward uh, is, is working on. But let's hear from Caroline, all the way from sunny Doncaster. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Caroline. We've had a break in the rain, um, okay, uh, thankfully. We've had snow and uh, rain this week, and you're probably aware, Quasi, about the concern about floods. And, and I suppose, again, something that um, we discussed today, we've always been a country that discusses the weather. Um, but in the last, I would say, 10 to 15 years, the changes in our weather and the extremities of our weather conditions, making us think more closely about the impact of climate change on that. And it has become a talking point in communities, to be honest, for whom maybe talking about the environment in its broadest sense and climate change was not really top of their agenda. And, uh, and clearly that's one aspect of this debate that needs to be uh, tackled. I feel that, you know, living as we all are at the moment, um, still in 2021, uh, with the pandemic and the massive changes that's made to our, all, our lives and the sadness it's brought with us with that, there is still within what's happened in the last year, a sense of how our country can come together 
and make enormous changes on a national, local, personal and family level to tackle a major crisis. And clearly, um, whatever happens in the next 12 months, the consequences of this pandemic have had an enormous impact on our lives and how we live, but also importantly, as we know, uh, the economy as well. And we're all thinking through about how we're going to have to think about reshaping our economy in light of that and creating wealth again to get us back to a better place. And in many respects, that does link into our discussions about getting to zero in the next 29 years. I think in one of our reports, um, we mentioned that actually it took over 30 years to make a decision about Heathrow Airport and the runway. I'm not even sure if we're still there yet. Um, we've got 29 years uh, to reach uh, this target and it seems a long time, but it's not uh, a long time. And what we can learn, I think, from the pandemic is that when we are really focused on where we need to get to and what we need to solve, we can somehow marshal uh, different types of groups from politics, from science, from innovators, from engineers, from business, from community groups and organisations to really put their shoulder to the wheel and make a difference. And that's the energy, that is the energy, excuse me for using that, um, that we need um, going forward. I think we found that people are able to make huge changes and by 2050, people and businesses are gonna have to move mountains to make jobs, homes and how we live much cleaner to stop our planet overheating. And I think what's also hopeful about all this is that in an era when British politics I know only too well in recent years became very polarized. Uh, it's a big plus that when it comes to tackling climate change, the UK has led the world in showing that consensus on this challenge is the way forward. Um, it's worth reminding ourselves that, you know, whilst when Carol and I first became an MPs in 1997, uh, to be honest, climate change was not on the agenda. It didn't mean it wasn't an issue, but it just wasn't on the agenda and it hadn't been before in any real substantial way. But in 2008, the Climate Change Act set targets to reduce greenhouse gases. Only five members of parliament voted against that piece of legislation. Yeah. We were the first in the world to lead in this way. And in 2019, of course, a tougher target has now been set. And we are the, you know, the first major economy to legislate for net zero emissions by 2020. And also what that tells us is that sometimes in politics, we do have to try and find a way uh, to form a consensus on some of the issues that will not be resolved within one term of parliament, two terms of parliament, or three terms of parliament. These are the issues that we need to forge some sort of consensus in order to make sure we can plan our way forward in a way that gets to the target, but also brings the country with us. And, and that's something that, you know, that concerns me because we know that actually for some communities in our country, for some families, for some people, for some businesses, the transition to net zero is going to be easier. And for others, it's going to be a, a lot harder. I think it was interesting for me if I, and I looked at, you know, some of the uh, uh, changes that we've already seen in our country and, and probed a little bit more into, you know, what that was telling us about how we are today and where we've got to. Um, the UK's manufacturing, industrial heat and electricity sectors have all been decarbonised by around half since 1990. We have you know, the highest rates in the G7 when it comes to that, and well done. Some of that is clearly to do with a positive move to greener energy, cleaner and renewable energy. But it's also the case that deindustrialisation and importing more goods from countries where production is cheaper over the same period has played its part too. And that has left many communities, my own and others, uh, without the work that made them feel part of the national endeavour, where industrial and manufacturing work supported families and kept their towns and villages alive. And I was really pleased, uh, Secretary of State, uh, that you mentioned about energy and how, um, how encouraging it is that that is one area that doesn't rely on London and the South East to be the game changer. That actually when you are talking about industries that will seek to rebalance our economies and offer something uh, to many smaller towns and communities across the UK, energy is one of those areas and energy efficiency I would suggest as well 
are the areas where we know that that really can happen and is happening already. Uh, we have seen also over that same period, jobs have gone to places like China and India, where their manufacturing and industrial emissions are up by 370% and 280% respectively, and China's emissions from heat and electricity have rocketed by 540%. So again, you know, one of the challenges in this for us as a country and to be a leader in the world debate on getting to zero is how do we do that without sacrificing many of the livelihoods of families and communities across the UK? And how do we make sure we don't do that in a way that basically enables or encourages other countries to not get to get to zero as well? There is no gain. There is no gain in offsetting our own emissions into a country or a continent uh, further afield. And when my, my colleague Caroline mentioned about muscular economic nationalism, it's absolutely right, Secretary of State, that we need to think about, and during the course of the debate today, I'm sure we'll have questions on this, about how we can harness and realize private finance into the many different aspects of getting to zero and greening our economy will demand. But it's also the leadership and the leverage that government has to make a difference as well in these areas about how we task our universities and others and support them to do the detailed work for making a dream a reality. Um, from making sure that in government, when it comes to tax credits, that we're actually um, infusing and, uh, and initiating people to take that next step in greening their business and their firm and retraining their workers. It's about using the huge amount of money that government does have, that it spends every single day in procurement and elsewhere to again create the opportunities and the seedbed for others to follow that lead as well. And therefore it will be a public-private partnership in many respects that is going to be the, the need to make this come, become a reality and happen. Uh, my community that I represented was built from coal, um, but I never doubted the need to press forward to create a, a cleaner, greener future. Um, some in the green lobby, I think when I was Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change, often felt that they needed to be punitive in how they treated people living in energy busting homes or working in energy intensive industries, relying on diesel cars to get from A to B. I think it's worth reminding ourselves that not everybody lives in a city with 24-7 public transport and can make congestion charges and parking fees pave a new way of, of living. Um, I used to despair at the lack of understanding about those who don't live in or have the means to make their homes more energy efficient. People who, even if they wanted to, couldn't dream of affording a hybrid, let alone an electric car, and even if they could, there is no electric charger within walking distance to their home or workplace. It's why I championed fairer bills as well as saving the polar bears, why I argued energy, energy efficiency to be an infrastructure priority. And as you said, Minister, a green industrial revolution is exactly the sort of language we should be using, but it can't be a middle class one that lays waste to the jobs of communities in the one I representative. I was really relieved to hear on her 18th birthday, Greta Thunberg say she'll never tell anyone off for flying. Some people tuning into this might think that is a terrible thing to say, but part of it is every sector of our economy is going to have to become greener, but also the messaging we send out mustn't be one that for many people for their one flight a year on a holiday, it seems far off these days in a pandemic and lockdown, is the one thing that they look forward to on a yearly basis. Those people need to feel that tackling climate change is an opportunity and not a threat. And that's where I want to go to next. It is a real opportunity here to take stock of the way our industry and manufacturing has declined over many decades and how actually by embracing climate change and the innovation it brings with it, we not only can sustain jobs, but in a cleaner, greener way, but create new jobs for the future. And within that, across the piece, there's a real opportunity uh, to meet the needs of those communities described as red wall or left behind. Many years ago, Caroline and I, as new MPs, established the first all-party childcare group. We discovered that there was a beer and caravan group. 
think they still exist today. <laughs> Childcare child was not there, hard to believe, I know. And I'm really delighted to work with Caroline again with an array of uh, experience across our steering group. Look, we know that there are many voices in this arena and many expert voices in areas for whom I bow to their expertise and, and experience. I think what we hope to do is harness the thinking and ideas to achieve net zero without sacrificing tens of thousands of jobs and where jobs are lost, how we can retrain those workers for new homegrown greener jobs. It is really important that we recognize that whilst political parties will have their own ideas, and that's good, that we have great innovators, scientists, manufacturers and engineers already stepping up, that we need debate and we need to stress test those ideas. But also importantly, I'll end on this, sometimes we do need to create lasting policy, a consensus on those fundamentals to truly make a difference. We wouldn't have a state pension scheme or the NHS today without that. And today we need that consensus building to tackle social care, but also to tackle getting to zero. Stop and start is not gonna work over the next 30 years. But above all else, Minister, we need to be successful in not only delivering net zero, but taking people with us from every community across the UK. Thank you very much, Caroline, indeed for that. And you know, really, I, I would echo everything you said, and that of itself demonstrates the political consensus that exists around the need to decarbonise our economy. I'm going to come to Guy in just a minute, but I just wanted to put some challenges onto Quasi's radar screen, um, especially because we know, Quasi, you are well versed in this subject, but there's some, the, the, the research by Onward already shows some very important geographic challenges uh, they're right down to the granular level of constituency by constituency, which are going to be the most vulnerable if we move to net, well, when we move to net zero, and which actually are the least vulnerable. And in, very important, as we've already highlighted, the, the Midlands and the North, the manufacturing heartlands of the United Kingdom, of course, have a huge number of jobs at risk, almost half of all jobs at risk are in those places, which by coincidence happen to be the politically volatile red wall seat. So that's an added picossi for any politic politician viewing this. But I'm so glad Caroline touched on the rural urban divide. I've already seen some really good questions coming in on this webinar about what can cities do? What can local government do? What I think we can't gloss over are the very big challenge in rural areas where there isn't the public transport network. Um, there's virtually none to speak of and not, not one that you can easily sustain a living from. And also, we shouldn't forget one of the high emitting industries is agriculture. So, you know, as a former DEFRA Secretary of State, I would say um, so to, to Kwasi, don't forget the huge challenge of trying to produce food tractors are powered by diesel and battery technology is moving but hasn't yet managed to crack the code on uh, HGV and, and high, high energy traction that we use hydrocarbon fuel to pump. So we really, really got to think about the challenge for agriculture and all the industries that depend on that. Fishing is another industry that's very vulnerable as we move to a net zero economy, marine fuels are hydrocarbons. And again, high traction, you know, these are big technological challenges. When we come to Guy and we start to think hard about industry and its need for mitigation, we, we need to think about these particular cases. But two more I just want to mention to you, Quasi, critically important for the car industry, which is the biggest employer in, in, in my area. Um, there is a global race on to be the first producers of uh, affordable electric cars. And uh, to achieve that, there needs to be major innovation in how they're powered in battery technology. And the uh, UK is really up against the challenge of uh, large car producers around the world also trying to affect that huge transformation in their industry. And to do this in the context of COVID and the economic uh, pressure that's causing um, on the, the consumption of goods like cars. And then the second thing just to put on your radar screen is the, you know, it's fantastic opportunity. Um, 
net, getting net zero heat is one of the biggest challenges. It is easier, yeah. as you described, to move to different um, low carbon or zero carbon energy sources. But at the moment, the 25 domestic dwellings in this country would need about 10,000 pounds worth of investment per dwelling to get them to net zero. But the average level of savings of people in domestic dwellings is no more than a thousand pounds. So there is a huge challenge, but also a huge opportunity because a veritable army of people would need to be trained, retrained in order to adapt our housing stock to net zero. So that, that's why with Caroline, I share the optimism that, that getting to net zero brings opportunities but I also share her concerns that it doesn't fall disproportionately geographically on those least able to uh, transform through it. We really, it's the mitigation we're going to need. Now I'm going to move to Guy who has patiently waited. Um, and Guy, yours is the floor now for your perspective. Thanks, but thanks very much, Caroline. So um, first point I'm going to make is if it follows, follows on from, from some of the points that, that Caroline Flint made, because I, I'm going to talk about the, the innovations that are needed and the great companies that are working. But if we're going to meet this, this challenge the, and the opportunity of, of net zero, it's essential that we, we think seriously about, about the practical politics of net zero. <clears throat> I don't mean the kind of helicopter politics, which tends to uh, dominate the debate. Should we have net zero by 2050 or 2045 or 2036 or, or wh whatever's what's going on? It's the real retail politics. How do you get real consent for the changes uh, and transition that's going to be uh, required? Because, you know, we can all see polls that say that 75, 80, 90 percent uh, kind of support for net zero uh, as, a, as a concept. But... Our work, when we look in detail at what consumers and, and people actually understand, will say that 47% of people don't realize that their boiler is contributing to climate change. So you've got to think what you've got to do to those people. You've got to make them realize that's the problem. And then you've got to think about an unfamiliar uh, technology. So that's why this onward project, this onward piece of work is so important, thinking through what the implications of this transition are going to be and what the uh, opportunities. Because the first phase of decarbonization, which has been a huge uh, a huge success and, and indeed a kind of huge cross-party um, success has been relatively painless for consumers. You know, ultimately, my lights still come on when, uh, uh, when, I, when, I, when I flick the switch, even though the electricity is probably coming from an offshore wind turbine rather than from coal-fired power station. There has been concern about bills, but bills are broadly um, the same. You know, the kind of increased unit cost has been more than offset by the increased efficiency of LEDs and, 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 and other areas. So it's still big challenges in power, you know, but they're kind of technocratic. How do you make sure it all fits together? How do you make sure you've got the institutions right? Think about market design, uh, uh, et cetera. It only gets political if it goes really wrong and the lights start uh, 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 wobbling. Um, but the next phase of decarbonisation is going to be is going to be different because you're talking particularly about transport and the switch to electric vehicles. That's a different experience for people um, versus what they have uh, at the moment. And you're talking about buildings, um, which I'll come on to in a second. To, to, to Caroline Spellman's point, that's a that's a huge challenge. And that's why I would say one of the most the most striking moment of the 10 point plan, and there's loads of great stuff in there, but the most striking moment of the 10 point plan was the decision around 2030 and the internet. That showed real uh, kind of political bravery uh, to, to be able to take on something that means something to people. You know, offshore wind is still, you know, it's, it, it matters for jobs, but, but when you're talking about people's cars, you're getting into uh, their kind of soul in some ways. And buildings is going to be an even bigger challenge. We've got to go from 20,000 kind of low carbon heating systems a year to about 20,000 a week. And it needs to be, uh, that's a huge opportunity for a new set of skills in different parts of the country, but let's not, uh, uh, let's, let's not um, shy away from that. And we've got to have the heart of that, be thinking about consumer facing propositions, which are as good or ideally better than what we have now in heating buildings. And Caroline and I were moaning about the difficulty of getting our rooms at the right temperature in our, in our houses before, beforehand. You know, most people, lots of people's heating experience is actually 
you know, a bit mixed, draft, stamp, etc. So can we tackle all of those issues, reduce bills and uh, move to new technologies? That's, uh, that's a really, it start from the consumer end rather than what tends to dominate the debate, which is hydrogen versus heat pumps, yada, yada. Um, and we all kind of get bored to tears. Um, so, and there are incredible companies that we work with who are operating in this space, you know, Passive Systems, uh, uh, Synergy, uh, Sunamp, Origami, Logical, they're all trying to work out how they can make this for consumers. And as Quasi said, the job for government is how you get the framework right so they can compete on a level, uh, level, level playing field. And that's a mix of uh, regulation of subsidies, of market design, uh, and making sure that, and that's, you know, we speak with a lot of uh, innovators, small, medium size and, and large, and that's their number one ask always comes down to, how do we make sure that, that we can compete in a level playing field? Because that's, um, that's what they want. So think about, you know, comms narratives, communications narratives that are gonna work. It's about greener equals is better. I used to think it was just about greener equals cheaper, but actually I think better is, is, a, is a bigger focus, particularly when you're talking about buildings. Just an aside, because somebody raised it, I think, you know, Caroline talked about getting in towns and cities, et cetera. I think there's going to be a really important role for um, kind of uh, sub-national activity in this area, whether it's devolved administrations or, or local mm -hmm. offices. We've had all these climate emergencies declared, which are fantastic. Uh, I'm involved with UK 100, the, the, the charity, and it's helped uh, uh, push some of, some of those, but they don't yet have actionable investable plans. So, you know, uh uh it's it's really important we make progress uh in in kind of subnational in in places as it were and that can really help with leveling up an uh a, a agenda um you know the, so that's you know that's one of the hard challenges we've talked about buildings another hard challenge on on evs but when you get to the really hard stuff you're talking about heavy industry uh in particular aviation agriculture that's uh, that's what others um, and these will be difficult industries to, to address. And the danger is, as, as, as Caroline pointed out, one option is we achieve decarbonisation by them all going abroad, um, which uh, won't, uh, which is absolutely unsatisfactory for everyone because it won't reduce emissions particularly, it'll probably increase them uh, and it won't help with, with jobs. So how can we think about those industries? What's, uh, what's a kind of important way? Because we need to give them an innovation path which is going to be uh, 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 important. So first of all, it's probably working on a sector basis internationally to build a consensus around it. In the same way we've had coal, kind of powering past coal alliance, which has built consent on different countries that are going to go well. We need, a, we need the similar alliances for cement, for chemicals, uh, for steel, thinking about that way. We probably need to get serious about border tariffs um, and post Brexit. That's a really interesting kind of trade uh, question, which uh, needs to be needs to be worked through because people shouldn't be punished for doing the right thing on climate. And I mean that at a national level and an individual level. But there is a huge uh, UK opportunity here, and that's why lots of the the work that the minister talked about in the ten point plan is is really important. You know the the the, the support for hydrogen, the support for CCUS. Uh, etc. You know, they will need support to start this, this journey. Because Britain's role in this, everyone will always say, oh, well, you know, you're only 1.2% of emissions. But the, the role here and the, mm -hmm. the political drive has got to be around setting a compelling example to the rest of the world about how to decarbonize. It has to be something that, that other countries look on and go, oh, I thought this was going to be really painful. But look, look at these, you know, these, these new companies that are sprouting up. Um, as well as supporting people who are going through that transition. Thank you. That's a really positive note to end on. And uh, just to sort of underline that, of course, the UK will need a good outcome from the conference of the parties. And that means, you know, possibly a border tariffs, who knows? But Quasi will no doubt have some reflections on that. Now, the next uh, stage of our webinar is that my namesake, Caroline, is going to host the Q&A session. I'm hoping that, Quasi, you can still uh, uh, be part of this for as, for as long as you can. But you've got a good long chunk of time now. Caroline, over to you. Thanks very much, uh, Caroline. And um, we've got had a num we've had some com questions come before and there's some popping up on the screen that I'm looking at now. So um, I'm going to read them out. And, you know, I don't, want, <laughs> I don't want the Secretary of State, but I do want you to take a full load of these questions. But I'll also ask Car Guy and Caroline to offer some of their comments as well to give you a bit of a breather 
uh, Secretary of State. So but I just have to <laughs> warn you that I, I've got to go at mid, midday at noon. So all right, OK, I'll well, let's... They'll all come your way in the next 15 minutes in that okay, case. OK, thanks. fine. So let's start with a couple that we've had, because you raised it in your contribution, uh, Kwasi, about finance. And we've had a question sure. from uh, the Association of British Insurers, um, and two, in fact, which is about the financial services sector and insurers, and that you know the potential for reforms that will make it easier for insurers and long-term savings to invest more in green infrastructure. How do you see that happening and how could the government maximise the impact of such increases in investment? So I think a very, I mean, sorry, this has been raised uh, with me before. And one uh, easy example to, to cite is the rules around or the, the way in which um, local authority, local government uh, pensions are structured. So currently we had, and thanks to George Osborne, he did consolidate a lot of these funds. So in the past, you had all these different local authorities that had pension funds. And of course, you've got lots of smaller buckets. And if you've got a small pension fund or a small investment fund, it's very much harder to access uh, investment in green technologies than if you're part of a much bigger fund. And so that's something which um, I'm uh, raising uh, with, the, with the Chancellor in terms of how, uh, and, all, and what George Osborne did was I think he, he, he agglomerated all these different uh, pension pots into eight uh, different pension pots, but th there is a case for for further um, um, you know, looking at that again. And I think once we've got bigger uh, funds, um, then then they can deploy capital more easily. The other thing uh, we have to do is, um, and the Chancellor announced this, is the National Infrastructure Bank. I think the National Infrastructure Bank, which will be uh, funneling investment uh, into these projects in much the same way that the Green Investment Bank did will also, I think, create more liquidity in terms of being able to invest in, uh, in, in green projects. And the other thing we have to do is actually have green projects. So um, it's all very well saying, you know, we want to have them, but unless we actually produce them and boots on the ground, um, then um, a lot of finance will, won't, won't be able to be invested in it. So there's a bit of a chicken and egg uh, thing in that. But there's no doubt in my mind that the real successes that we've had, particularly in offshore wind, uh, capacity building have been through uh, private investment, through unlocking private investment. There's no government in the world uh, that could that could invest that much so quickly in in offshore wind technology. How how important is it going to be? Just to add to that about decision making about some of the directions of travel we want to make. I mean, one question that's come up. You mentioned hydrogen uh, in your contribution. Quasi. And uh, one question from WA Comms is, is what more does industry need to do to convince government that hydrogen is a viable and safe alternative to gas? So what sort of decision making needs to happen yeah, so, for investors and when? That, that's a great question. So, so there's, a, there's a common, there's a consensus that hydrogen is going to be a big part of the decarbonisation story. And then, of course, you've got to work out where the hydrogen can be used. So there are three, possibly four main areas. One uh, that's emerged very quickly is in transport, uh, particularly in heavy, heavy goods vehicles. Uh, we're looking at um, hydrogen trains, hydrogen buses, HGVs. Um, uh, a second one is in the industrial uh, decarbonisation process, where hydrogen can be used in industrial processes uh, as opposed to fossil fuel-based um, uh, uh, energy. And then the third is, as the question uh, described, is replacing effectively hydrogen uh, with, uh, sorry, uh, natural gas with hydrogen. And the irony of that is people who know their um, economic history and their history of fuel will know that town gas, which we replaced in the 60s and 70s with natural gas, town gas, as I remember, as I understand it, was 50% hydrogen. Um, but we need to make, uh, hydrogen has lots of connotations. Uh, there are lots of safety issues. You know, some older people remember the Hindenburg and all of that kind of thing. So there is a, a job to persuade people that this is safe. We are having experiments now. We've got um, hydrogen-based uh, uh, towns or villages. Uh, that's in the pipeline. The Prime Minister mentioned that in his 10-point plan. But we've got to make sure it, it's really, really safe. And, 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 and the, the actual timeline in terms of delivery on this isn't as long as, as people think. I think within seven or eight years, we could well be in a system where we've got hydrogen uh, being distributed uh, in the old gas network. And of course, that would help uh, very considerably in decarbonisation. 
Well, that's always a good thing if you can use some of the existing infrastructure to deliver something new. So. That would be the trick. I mean, there, there are things you have to modify, but, that, but that's something that we're looking at very closely. So we've had a couple of questions, um, so on uh, cities, but also um, local government um, and the devolved administration, which Guy touched upon. So Matthew uh, Penchars, I hope I pronounced that right, he said the UK through BASE has been a supportive organisation such as C40, which is an alliance of cities, cities sharing mm -hmm. best practice to tackle climate change. What role do you think cities um, and uh, their governments here in the UK and globally have to address climate change? And also from Toby Savage, maybe to join these two together. He's a council leader and a member of a mayoral combined authority. He wants to understand, you know, what's the role of local regional government in delivering this agenda on the ground and within our communities. I know a number of them are already making plans. One council the other day I read about who's trying to look forward where no one will live less uh, more than five minutes away from an electric charging point. That sort of vision making at a local level. I think the local government uh, story, the local, I mean, it's not just about local government. It's not just about, uh, you know, the, the, the same, uh, you know, local political institutions. Uh, we've got LEPs. We've got to think about how we're, we're engaging local businesses in pushing the agenda. But this is, again, a very strong and important question. I think with the mayoral uh, uh, authorities, uh, we have had lots of progress in this. I mean, I speak a lot to Ben Houchen, Andy Street, uh, Andy Burnham, you know, um, mayors of different political uh, colours, uh, and they're all very, very enthused uh, by net zero. They all um, have projects uh, that they want to pursue and drive in their own areas, and I think they will have a part to play. Now, where you don't have uh, mayoral, uh, local mayors in that way, the mayoral authority, um, you know, we're going to have to have partnerships with with other local authorities uh, on a smaller, um, uh, uh, that are small, less uh, extensive. Um, and there are lots of different ways uh, that we're looking to try and promote this. Uh, you will know that the, with the UK Shared Prosperity Fund, you know, we're in discussions about how that will be deployed. Um, you know, MHCLG, I sp I'm speaking actually to the Secretary of State about this very issue uh, this afternoon. We don't have a definitive uh, plan as yet because um, it's an evolving picture, but there has to be some local involvement, uh, as you say, in, in pushing net zero, partly because uh, it's only at the local level that you're going to get the buy-in or it's easier to get the buy-in uh, from communities at a local level than just as a, a national a national message that people like me uh, would be promoting. Thank you. Um, carbon border tax. What's, um, what's your position in the government's thinking uh, about that? And could that be something that would become a, a subject you'd want to lead on at uh, COP26 in November? I think, I mean, these are fabulous questions. I mean, this is exactly the kind of discussion that I think will be taking place uh, at COP26. But of course, the, the issue with carbon adjustment uh, taxes is that it, it doesn't make sense really to act unilaterally. Because all, let's say if we, if we were to um, impose some form of tariff on, on, on carbon uh, products that have been uh, essentially made through excessive carbon emissions, all that, if we did that unilaterally, all that would mean would be that the products would be sold in other jurisdictions and you wouldn't actually get a net reduction uh, in carbon emissions. So I think, my, and I've expressed this on the floor of the House, we had a, a debate when I was a Minister of State precisely on this issue. I think there has to be a, an international, more international agreement on, on how to treat uh, uh, carbon uh, that's traded uh, across different countries. And I know that you know, counterparts in the EU are looking at this as well, but I think there has to be an international uh, agreement. Some people would disagree. They would say we should go out unilaterally and and uh, put tariffs on high uh, carbon emitting products or products which have used high carbon emissions. But I think an international approach is the best way. And on that, I think it will be part of a, a, a serious discussion at the uh, at the COP26 this year. Thank you. That question, by the way, came from Hannah Dillon from uh, Zero Carbon. Good. Now, yeah. I've got a question here from Rebecca uh, Zeitlin, who talks about in terms of incentivizing private investment in green technologies, a lot of money invested in R&D through Innovate UK's excellent programs. Um, but some of the technologies needed to drive decarbonisation struggle to find funding through the financial markets. They're not mature enough or profitable Great. enough yet for private finance. Um, but they're too mature. They're stuck between the, a rock and a hard place. They're yeah. too mature for R&D funding. Can, can government provide the catalyst to change that? I think we can. I mean, if, if you take one example, and this was something which 
um, all of us, I mean, both Carolines, we were all in, in Parliament uh, between 2010 together and uh, 20, well, I can't remember, 2019, I suppose. Um, and, and you will remember how offshore wind took off. I mean, in 2010, when I arrived in Parliament, offshore wind seemed almost cranky. You know, a lot of people were very sceptical about it. And we managed to construct uh, an auction process, it's called a contract for difference, that essentially drove the price of offshore wind down from something like 120 pounds a megawatt hour to now 39 pounds. So that's a two thirds decrease in cost where at the beginning of the process, it was very expensive. So that was an ex a really good example of how government coming up with a, a structure, an incentive structure, managed to drive down costs. And we need to look at other ways uh, in which the contracts for difference uh, structure can actually encourage um, production of uh, uh, you know, decarbonized energy. An example of that would be, I think, in a lot of the marine technologies, people are talking about tidal power. There are lots of things that we're looking to where, as you say, they're, they're kind of beyond the R&D phase, but they're at a point where it's not, um, it doesn't make sense economically to deploy them commercially now. And we've got to think of a way as a government to try and incentivize that production. I think the same thing will happen with uh, renewable hydrogen, green hydrogen. You know, we need to think of a way, a mechanism whereby um, electrolyzer um, produced hydrogen uh, can actually go down the cost curve and become more economic. Thank you. Um, I've got a question here uh, from um, Patrick Mann. How's, how's your relationship with DEFRA, Minister? He says, <laughs> it's very good. In his, his question here is, look, we need, we obviously focus on energy, but use of resources and obviously sure, the amount sure. of waste that we produce is an important factor in all this. So um, you know, how can we know, be, reassure us that uh, Bayes is working with DEFRA so, to make resource efficiency fully incorporated into the net zero policy? So I'm, I'm going to make a, a sort of rather nerdy point about the structure of government and, and hear me out. I think it's very important. Both Carolines will remember having been ministers that there is a kind of siloed approach uh, to government. You know, once you're in the department, you're very much focused on your department. And the way in which British government has evolved is that we're not so good at, at working across different departments. Now, I think we're changing. Um, I think that uh, you've got individual departments. You've also got cross Whitehall committees uh, where you're looking at policy uh, in the round. What I've done certainly as a Minister of State is, is actually try and improve bilateral relations between different departments because our structure doesn't, doesn't really have that. You know, so we've, you know, we've established, I established a forum with the Department for Education on green skills, green jobs, where there's clearly a, a synergy between uh, gr the green agenda that we pursue in Bayes and also the skills agenda, which the DfE owns. Similarly with DEFRA, you know, we, we talk about um, things like offshore wind uh, deployment, where there's a huge issue in terms of building offshore wind uh, and the environmental impact on birds, on uh, mollusks, on sea life uh, that, that, that that has. But, but you identify an issue. There isn't, in the structure of British government, there isn't a, a, a natural or automatic um, process by which uh, two departments in, in these cases come together. And it's very much a job of the ministers uh, to do that. And as Secretary of State, and certainly as Minister of State, I'm always looking to, to, to make good bilateral uh, uh, relations between our department base and others. And I think Guy or someone mentioned the fact that we're working very hard with the transport department, because clearly with EVs, that's an area where both Bayes and the Department for Transport, and also with the Jet Zero, we set up a, a Jet Zero Council, which is looking at sustainable aviation fuels. You know, those are those are areas where those two departments, in this instance, Bayes and Transport, can work together. And DEFRA and Bayes clearly uh, can be working a lot more uh, closely. And that's one of the, the jobs, one of my uh, priorities uh, in this role. Um, I'm going to put two questions together um, because I think there's a sort of segue into Sam Hughes asks about um, how we how we engage the public and get public backing, you know, and how will government approach communicating the you know the massive changes that are going to require in people's lives that brings them with us rather than yes, um, yes. finds them. And then linked to that, I think, is a question here uh, uh, from Mark, Malcolm Harbour, who says, "How do we encourage strategic public?" procurement to drive new markets, new companies, create jobs. Does the current green paper on procurement need to be reinforced? Perhaps you could take uh, those two together. So this is going to be my last um, contribution. 
I mean, procurement, uh, there's a whole range of issues now we've left uh, the EU, which, which means that we've got a, a lot more flexibility, I think, in terms of uh, procurement policy. And that's absolutely something that we're looking at uh, very closely, particularly with regard to the green agenda. And I think the government ourselves, in terms of our own housekeeping, uh, could be uh, even more proactive in terms of our government procurement process uh, to, to promote net zero. Um, I, think, I, think there's, I think we could do more in, in that. Uh, and the, the earlier question is absolutely critical. I mean, how do we bring the public along? Um, I'll just say two things about that. One is that um, those of us who fought the 2019 election, general election, I was struck by how often actually green issues came up on the doorstep in my constituency. And I fought five general elections as a candidate. Um, was mostly I've been elected, but sometimes not. Um, and, and, and it was never, it was, it's never been an, an issue really on the doorstep in the way that it was in 2019. So I think there is public awareness, but clearly, you know, the government has a lot of work to do uh, to try and bring the public along. I mean, what Guy was saying about uh, the fact that the more difficult, uh, more impactful in terms of individuals' lives, um, issues like to do with heating, to do with uh, decarbonizing transport, those are the, the next challenges you know, building, uh, replacing coal-fired uh, electricity generation with offshore wind is not as uh, tangible a change to most people's lives than replacing, uh, you know, internal combustion engines with electric vehicles or um, hydrogen-powered vehicles. And also, you know, getting people off the gas network and getting them to heat mobs. That's a real uh, tangible thing. I'd love to spend more time actually um, uh, discussing these issues. Maybe, you know, I can come again. But, um, but for now, I'm afraid I've got to go to another, another call. Thank you so much, Kwasi. Thank you Thanks. very much. That's really Thank good. We might take you up on your offer, I think. No, I'd love to. I'd love talking about this. <laughs> definitely, definitely, definitely. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you very much. Thank you. All the best. Caroline, um, Guy, um, there are some more questions, but I thought maybe we could come to each of you yeah. and you might want to add to some of the points that You're have been raised in questions. Caroline. I'd love to. There are a couple of things there. There was a very good question from Malcolm Harbour, who was formerly the chairman of the Internal Market Commission in the European Parliament, about public procurement. And you know, this is so important, not just centrally, but locally. And I've got a lovely worked example to share of just what could be achieved by local government public procurement. My local authority negotiated um, a contract on behalf of this, all the social housing to switch from gas to wood chip boilers in its high rise blocks. And um, this arose of course from the funding in the, in the windfall tax that was the source of the funding. But nonetheless, the ability of a local authority to negotiate a huge change and to move away from carbon to a, a carbon neutral source. And the, the convert, uh, when one of the silver linings was the energy bills of the tower blocks, which were also fitted with double glazing and thermostatically controlled radiators, reduced by half. And actually, that's, the, that's a very important win-win when we're talking about levelling up, that if one can move to a different form of domestic heating that is low or zero carbon, um, and do it in such a way as to make the, the lives of the people who live in their homes more sustainable. She said, freezing in her polar neck jumper with her heat on. The second, the second um, question I just wanted to come back to because it's my old subject area was the question from Patrick Mann about what we could do to reduce the waste of carbon in our resources. One huge area where carbon is wasted is food waste. So we actually discard 12 billion pounds worth of food every year. It's astonishing. That almost equates the amount of money that we were spending on international development assistance for the world's poorest people. I've always thought it's a huge scandal, but just think about the carbon involved in the creation of that food and the carbon in the food itself. So you know, there are tremendous opportunities to reduce carbon consumption through tackling the waste in the resources we use. Thanks, Caroline. Guy. Thanks. Yeah, just a couple of points I, 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 I do. Just building on that local side, and I, I do think this kind of local national debate is actually one of the big strategic questions that the government is like, going to have to grapple with when it thinks about the next uh, phase of, of net zero. And if all we had to do was decarbonise the power sector, uh, mm -hmm. as I said, I probably wouldn't worry about it. 
actually, the role of local authorities to be around the edges. But uh, when you're talking about transport, you're talking about building, it's, you know, the, the decarbonisation plan of uh, Meriden is very different from the decarbonisation plan of the Don Valley, Glasgow, you know, or Cornwall, whatever, whatever it, um, whatever it is, because you need to understand the building stock, you need to understand the state of the pipes and wires in the ground, you need to understand all of this stuff. And right now we have a missing piece of kind of institutional arrangements that allow to do it. So you've got 200 odd local authorities declaring climate emergencies, some of them in kind of uh, ambitious timescales, should we say, and absolutely, you know, in many cases, no, no idea how they're going to get there, they need a, so you know, this is what we've been working on the catapult kind of uh, a credible plan, investable plan that gets you uh, to, uh, to, to net zero and thinks about the transition. It also helps with your politics because it also helps, as you said, Cara, building, helping people through the conversation of what actually is gonna to need to change in their local area to get to net zero. How, how close is it reasonable to have a charging, a fast charging point for electric vehicles? What's their housing stock gonna look like? All of those, those questions, so that's very important. I'll just follow up on the, um, somebody asked about UKRI. Uh, point. So the catapult, we, you know, part of our job is to fill that space between the kind of uh, academic research and, and the market. You know, I would say as well, the biggest, you know, comes comes back to, um, you know, you can have innovate, innovate support schemes and demonstration schemes. Those are all very important. But if you haven't got a market at the end of it that is really serious, then you're always going to struggle for uh, investment. And that market could be driven by regulation, it could be driven by subsidy, it could be driven by carbon pricing. But right now we've got a kind of mess of incentives across the economy. And if we don't get those right, we're always going to be doing this with one hand uh, behind our back. I, I, I reiterate the procurement point. Um, it's, it's absolutely enormous, could be huge, particularly, you know, decarbonizing the public sector estate, which the government has made really serious commitments to. And we've been involved in projects about uh, working with uh, prisons and hospitals, uh, et cetera. It's hard, right? Changing a light bulb in a prison is not straightforward. Uh, quite <laughs> I've got simple. three prisons in Doncaster. No, four, in fact, three in my old constituency. Exactly. And you, and you, you know, we look at Catterick barracks and things like that, you know, a similar part of the world, um, you know, you, but we need to make that really easy and that will drive the supply chain. So, uh, yeah, procurement in and the public sector really leading in this way is is really essential. Mm, absolutely. How I mean, obviously, energy efficiency is a massive part of this. And it's interesting what you say about the power sector guy, because, you know, having been um, a former Shadow Secretary of State for this area, you know, one thing that compared to other markets is, dare I say it, energy is a managed market in terms of the regulation and how it operates. And, you know, one of the aspects of the last 10 years is how we had these, you know, six major companies dominating everything and where you could provide the insurgencies for others to come into this market and deliver and retail energy in a very different way both in private, but also community owned energy as well. But it's still the case when it comes to power, when it comes to the national grid, there's a huge lot of policy areas that government influences and pushes in the right direction. That's not so much the case in some of the other areas. What more can government be seen to be doing to be able to making that nudge in the right direction, but also incentivizing sectors to make the transition? Or do you think they'll just do it anyway? I, might, I don't think just do it anyway. I think there'll be, you know, we've. I, I would say as well, I would say net zero has been an absolutely galvanizing change. I mean, you know, bearing in mind that really what happened was 80% was crossed out on a piece of paper and, you know, 100% was, was, was added in. Um, it's, it's just changed, the, you know, and we, we're talking to companies all the time and they're, you know, they're, they're, everyone is looking both from the finance sector to, to every other sector about what it means for them. Partly because lots of them were kind of hiding in that last 20%. They're kind of thinking, oh, that's someone else's problem to worry about. But now it's everyone's. Uh, so that's everyone's problem. I think on the kind of supplier end, the really key question is whether we're going to be able to move to work. And this is back to this consumer experience, because really most people's relationship with their energy suppliers is pretty uh, kind of unsatisfactory or, 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 or pretty minimal. And, you know, uh, and I certainly don't have a model of where everyone's going to be at home, you know, being energy traders on their on their apps, on their phones. <laughs> but how do you how does energy companies um, and it might not be suppliers, it might be others coming into the industry. 
how do they make it really a better experience for 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 consumers and actually you know we've talked at like kind of service models where i don't buy a unit of energy i buy an outcome so i buy my heating schedule for my home and i can do it room by room mm -hmm. and once you've had that it's like when you first got an iPhone. Once you've had that better experience, uh, it's rubbish going back to uh, something else. I can say this has moved. Somebody's moved from a house where it had room by room control of their heating to somewhere where I have to turn the whole house on all the time. So, coming up with those better consumer propositions, yes. but that also means that we've got to, you know, from a political point of view, have a bit more trust in companies that they're that they're going to treat consumers in the right way. And you know, that's been, as as you both know, a pretty painful uh, history over the last 10 years, particularly for the what was the big six. Mm. Caroline, you, you know, both you and I um, have talked about energy efficiency and how important that is in all of this. I remember when I was housing minister, going to a, a, um, a sort of development that had actually been, I think, built in the sort of 80s and at the time it was a sort of you know it was out there in terms of energy efficiency but one thing I found walking around it was that the way we behave is important this as well and if you don't build homes that are as easy as breathing to use some of the different adaptations you know there's a honeymoon period where people do it and then it drops off you know how do you where do you think we should be going on the energy efficiency there's not a street i don't go past that doesn't have solar panels on its roof these days um but there's a huge number of homes that are in desperate retrofitting where is that going to fit in along with if you like planning and building standards that will demand new homes to be built in a different way yeah well i, I agree with you and having been a housing minister um you you will know that um actually there's an there's a there's been quite a lot of foot dragging in terms of the available technology, um, a resistance really in the construction of new buildings to incorporate that into buildings. I was astonished how many public buildings are put up without renewable energy features. I mean, I can't believe it's been known for so long that it's going to go in this direction. You're building a school, which if you're lucky is going to last you certainly a lifetime, hopefully a century, and yet built with no renewable energy features at all. I can't believe that is still possible in modern Britain. So the, the key must be in um, the regulatory framework that the construction industry operates in. I, I used to have an adage when I was Secretary of State at DEFRA, we need to make it easier for people to do the right thing. So if in fact it's baked in to the way your home works, and you know, particularly if like, like my former constituents, you can with your own eyes see that your energy bill has halved, um, you're going to align some very important goodwill behind changing our lifestyles to do things in a different way. But if we carry on throwing up uh, homes that uh, are expensive to heat, um, that rely on uh, traditional forms of energy and water conservation, then we're actually putting an obstacle in the way of the consumer who wants to do the right thing. So I think that, you know, wholesale look at those uh, building regulations, even though there might be resistance, it's got to be aligned to our legal obligation to be a net zero carbon economy. So, you know, these things do need to change and new technology uh, is coming on stream all the time. You know, we need to help those industries innovate. Well, we're going to, it seems to, in my view, that we're going to have to think more creatively about what systems of finance people can use where they're not going to be supported by the state. I mean, obviously, in social housing, um, homes were transformed when they had double glazing put in and new boilers and kitchens, you know, uh, you know, sort of the everyday things that are really important to people's lives. But the Green Deal was not as successful as people hoped it would be. It, it didn't inspire the communication strategy didn't work and getting the finance wasn't there. And in other countries, Germany have run similar systems, which seem to work a lot better and operate, often they operate on a regional level. Uh, so there's a much more direct contact with people and what's going on in communities. Um, is that an area in terms of sort of access for domestic users to green finance to make the improvements they need to make? Going to be have to be something that's going to have to spend more time on because it didn't work under green deal guy yeah I'd, I'd just say what one of the one of the things that really really um really could be transformative here is um 
is is one of the elements. I, I didn't talk much about digitalization of the energy system, but it's a really big, you know, the energy is slowly kind of, you know, like a slumbering giant coming into the uh, to the to, to the 21st century on this. And one of the areas is that is actually you have, you know, much better kind of understanding of, of whether the, you know, the, 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 the insulation or the measures you put in have been done properly. And you're only going to do that because uh, you know everyone, how, how do you have your loft done you think well have my bills gone down well am I feeling the draft so much quite difficult but, but if you have proper sensors in people's room which are dirt cheap and you and you join it up then you should be able to say actually it hasn't worked as well as it as it has and so therefore you can build guarantees off that then you can build proper finance packages uh, off that people have to tr trust it and the journey the double glazing industry is a really interesting one because it used to be a kind of, you know, byword for, for shysters, et cetera. And over time, it kind of got its act Apologies together. to any reputable double, double glazing people out there. <laughs> many, many years ago. Um, uh, but now uh, it's become desirable of people paying for it themselves, right? And But if you look at the pure energy payback, you know, amount of units of energy saved, but it's, it's terrible. But it's security. It's, uh, it's just a better consumer experience. And that's what we need to do with, you know, with, uh, with the whole heating and buildings uh, phenomenon. You asked about international comparisons with why, you know, as a country like Germany be more successful in overhauling its domestic and social housing stock uh, in, in terms of energy conservation. But there's always been a bit of institutional resistance here to investing in social housing. And, I, and I've always thought it's a, it's a real shame if you could actually align the sort of corporate investment, the pension funds behind the kind of transformation of the social housing stock, actually, um, it, in the long term, it's a, it is a very safe, if not meteoric form of investment. And that, of course, is what had attracted German corporate finance to investing in, in those areas. But also, rather like my local authority that realised that it was in their interest to transform the, the energy supply to these uh, 27 tower blocks was that if the residents can't pay their energy bills that suddenly becomes a big problem for the local authority because they probably then also can't pay their rent and then you end up with all the problems of homelessness and uh, the huge cost that that is on local authorities so there are reasons why our institutions would benefit from corporate finance coming into this transformation that needs to play, take place in, 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 in public provision of housing. Mm -hmm. Caroline, you, um, I think, led on in government on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Yes, yes. And we've had a question, <laughs> yes. we've had a question, yeah. we've had a question in from Glenn Martin. I wonder if you could, he's asking about, you know, what, what is the government doing to achieve this? Could the UN framework be used to identify needs and opportunities across the country at regional LEP uh, and combined authority level um, to help the government level up across communities. How could they be applied there? What do you think, Caroline? Yes, I saw that, and it's a very, it's a very good question from Glenn. And the answer is it, it, that's a very important foundation for the COP because all the countries, all 193, I think, on that occasion, countries signed up to those sustainable development goals. The way it's designed is that each country is has the freedom to decide how to fulfill the 17 goals to take account of their local circumstances. Because you can't have a global one size fits all approach to SDGs. But as far as the UK is concerned, you know, that's that can be cascaded down, as you say, to local government city regions because the, 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 the interpretation of those sustainable development goals will vary if you're in Manchester, Birmingham or East Cornwall. Mm -hmm. So it's important to get the local interpretation. But another thing that came out of that successful UN conference in Rio where SDGs were decided upon as a very important successor to the Millennium Development Goals is that actually the UK drove an initiative and put into the text that we, we, the, the UK wanted to see, and this was supported by um, companies in the city, mandatory reporting for sustainability. So if you or I want to invest some of our meager income in uh, stocks and shares, we might actually want to know how well the company that we're going to invest in is aligned 
to those climate change goals that we're signed up to, up to that might really matter to us. It might not just be that we morally want to see a company that has done something to change its practice to those goals, but actually there might be a very practical reason which, unless they've done nothing, if they've done mm. nothing to align themselves to the, the, the climate change agenda, then they may end up with stranded assets and we'll have made a very bad investment. So I think there's another question on the chat um, from uh, Nick Robbins, who's published um, uh, 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 The Road to Net Zero, that for the finance sector as well, I think this question of, you know, how sustainable are the companies that you are lending to. And it's very clear that financial institutions are now becoming more and more concerned about how they satisfy themselves on that point, because they too want to be connected to net zero. Our, our, our report, our launch report, obviously we highlighted um, the number of jobs that are high emitting jobs um, that could, will be affected by the change to net zero. Some of those jobs um, will be lost, but there are some that with the right support can be helped to make the transition. And of course, what we also starkly wrote to identify is that, you know, the, the communities in which, you know, are the highest emitters are particularly in, in areas that we've represented, Caroline, for many, yeah. many years, who have already suffered already, as I mentioned earlier, through deindustrialization with no plan uh, to revive their communities. Um, what do you think um, government needs to do about that? Do you think the government is scoping enough uh, those communities that and their different shapes, their different characters, their different uh, workforce to be able to actually identify much more clearly the different sorts of support that will be needed? And in particular, when it comes to the National Infrastructure Bank, you know, as Nick has raised in his question, it seems to me it's a bit of a no-brainer that we need to use money smartly but there will be some areas that might not be able to realise the private finance that others can, and therefore linking transition uh, to those bids for money from the National Infrastructure Bank will be important for those, particularly those communities and regions um, and communities within them that, let's, let's be honest about it, often haven't had the clout or the capital to find a way to fund themselves from one transition to another. Guys? Yeah. Yeah, so so it's it's a really uh, important question, and it comes comes out of the research in such a powerful um, such a powerful way. So so all credit to, to onward uh, for that. I think uh, when when I think about this, I think you've got to be thinking sector by sector. So of course you want a kind of wider economy wide framework, but actually you're going to need to think about the transitions in in different sectors because we're still going to want to move around. We're still going to need steel. We're still going to need chemicals. We're still going to need ceramics. We, you know, all, all of these kind of questions. We just need to do it in a in a in a in a low carbon low, low carbon way. And you need to be thinking about the particular challenges of each um, of each of each sector um, uh, because actually you know that that will be you know very geographically. Uh, uh, relevant, right? Because if you're talking about chemicals, there'll be three or four um, kind of important places. If you're talking about cement, it won't, won't actually be that many companies. You can get them around a the table. So you've got to be thinking about, right, well, what, what's a real credible transition plan for them? What support do you need? You also then need to have their back. And that's why the kind of trade aspect is so important. You know, really, really thinking uh, through what that means. And also you need to be building kind of alliances on thinking about the new technology across different countries who are going to go um in that in that way and that you know and then a kind of local level you've got to be thinking about right well you know if you've got a steel plant in your area what what really is the future for that steel plant and government and the company have to have actually quite a you know often uncomfortably for government potentially quite a strategic conversation about well what do you need to to shift to there because if you just if you're still using coal you can't quite see how that's going to be you know the the, the, the <laughs> Of base energy how that's going to be the case in 20 years so that's you know that that transition is a really interesting and difficult kind of government uh company dialogue that needs to happen thanks caroline what's your thoughts on that what about smes you know the smaller and medium-sized enterprises yes. that you know you know many companies you know small businesses often are in buildings that they don't own uh they're reliant on a landlord who doesn't necessarily oh, yeah. always want to invest in in sort of changes that are necessary 
Yes, and uh, you know this is actually rather important. If we've still got ABI on on the webinar, because uh, one of their number asked an important question earlier about insurance. And one of the things I discovered when I was visiting SMEs in in my constituency, whose premises had absolutely no renewable energy features, but they had because of the nature of their factory, huge expanse of uh, roofing, uh, uh, gently. Uh, inclined towards the sun and I and I said well surely you know fantastic opportunity you could cover this with solar panels and 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 you could get a, a low uh, zero carbon source but uh, they explained to me that as as tenant not landlord of the building the building's insurance would be invalidated if if even if their landlord allowed the solar panels to be adhered to the roof which the landlord wasn't prepared to do because of the structural risks involved. I mean, it, you, it makes you want to tear your hair out. And I guess a lot of people watching this webinar, that's quite a lot of different entities who would need to align behind the transformation of, of that potential in our, in, our, in our communities, because there's an awful lot of roof sp space with nothing on them. But I also wanted to pick up from your original question this business of um, the transformation of skills. I mean, we shouldn't kid ourselves. We're not starting our road to net zero on a level playing field. We start from a position where the skill set in different parts of our country is very variable. And uh, the lack of educational achievement sadly often correlates with post-industrial communities. And yet looking at some of the questions we've had this morning, which have come from council leaders or those who are involved in the running of their combined authority. The interesting thing is central government has devolved skills to the Metro mayors. And I think that with the resources to go with that, there is the opportunity through the cities and the city regions to drive the transformation in skills that's going to be necessary so that folks who today maybe don't have much in the way of job potential job opportunities, they can be caught in together with those who have well-paid jobs at the moment, but are at risk of losing them through our quest for net zero. And I think that the, the devolution of that reskilling and retraining together with central resources is going to be key to making sure that people don't lose out. That is perfect timing, may I say, Dame Caroline. Uh, we've come to the end of our webinar. Um, thanks, Guy, very much. Uh, thank you, Caroline. Thank myself as well. And thank, importantly, Secretary of State Kwasi Kwarteng for coming along because obviously he's only been in the job 13 uh, days. Um, we have a call for evidence from incumbent industries for the project that we're working on. For all of you taking part this morning, I hope we've tried to cover uh, your questions as best we can. Uh, for those we didn't, um, I'm sure we can ask... Uh, someone from onward to have a look at them and, and maybe get back to you or pass them on to the minister for that matter. Um, lots of voices in this debate are needed. There's a lot of heavy lifting to be done. And I think, Caroline Guy, I think we would say that, you know, one thing again that we can think of positively is that it looks like America is going to be back on board uh, for being part of a constructive debate. And that bodes very well for COP26, in which we want to play our part that all the people listening in today and viewing in today, but also around the world want to see work. Thank you very much, Brett. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.